analysis combines the data made popular in fantasy football with the latest sports betting trends to find you the sharpest angle. And for that, we welcome back the lead betting analyst from PicksWise, Jared Smith, making his return. Good to see you once again, man. Yeah, it's been a couple weeks, been on the road, doing some radio gigs. We're all over. This is a very busy time of year. Um, very exciting, though. We're in the stretch run well, of the NFL where we have a lot of data and the lines are sharp, so a little harder to find edges. Well, the cream rises to the top. You're in demand, and that's why uh, you, you know we're much. grateful to have a couple of minutes here with you. So uh, I want to start off with this line that just has everyone absolutely scratching their heads. The 5-7 and seven Detroit Lions are one-and-a-half-point favorites against the 10-2 and two Minnesota Vikings. Listen, this has happened nine times in the Super Bowl era. All but one of those has been on the final week of the season, which, of course, is always an anomaly. So how are you reading this? Yeah, the Vikings are kind of an anomaly this year, right? They've kind of slept with angels in terms of their win-loss record. But this is the exact type of game that we like to sink our teeth into, Steve, because the data says the Vikings are a very average football team. But their win-loss record says they're one of the best teams in the conference and competing for the number one seed and maybe a Super Bowl contender, right? But when you look that layer beneath... The Lions are actually the better team, and a lot of odds makers, a lot of ratings people, a lot of professional gamblers that I kind of converse with on a weekly basis are all kind of in lockstep that this game played on a neutral. They still maybe would make the Lions a favorite. So perhaps the data needs to enlighten us here. And the DVOA numbers, the EPA per play numbers, everything efficiency-wise, analytics-wise is saying Minnesota is about an average football team. And the Lions, especially over the last five weeks, where they're 5-0 and against the spread, covering by over 12 points per game, you're starting to see an uptick in defensive efficiency, which is something I didn't even expect. We've talked about this Lions team really struggling defensively this year, 32nd in EPA per play weeks one through eight. Well, over the last five weeks during this little stretch for Detroit, Aaron Glenn, former Jet defensive coordinator now of Detroit, really getting this man coverage blitz happy scheme to play as one. And the Lions right now are about a 15-16 on the efficiency scale with their defensive numbers and again coming from 32nd in weeks one through eight now a middle of the road team that's that's a pretty big improvement offensively speaking they're they're a top 10 unit right now their offensive lines playing like a top 10 unit jared goff and offensive coordinator ben johnson seem to be in sync a lot of things to like with how the lions are playing right now the vikings I don't know how they covered last week against the Jets. They were outscored by 200, or they're outgained by 200 yards. Net yards per play, they were a minus one and a half. The Jets went one for six in the red zone. Well, that was it right the there. Lions have the best red zone scoring offense in the league. I don't think that's going to happen this week. This, to me, is a very easy market indicator, red flag, bet the Lions, how are the Vikings underdogs? It's similar to that Vikings-Cowboys game a couple weeks ago. I think Detroit's the right side. And when you kind of peel back the layers as well, apparently the, the Lions are releasing standing room only seats for this game, which means oh, wow. they expect more than 70,000 fans. Now, why? what does that mean? Well, the Vikings are ninth, have the ninth most false starts and the fourth most delay of games this year. I know that those seem like, you know, um, you know, trivial penalties, but those could be very important when the crowd can play a role in a game like this. Absolutely. And I mentioned uh, I, those are great nuggets because I do think first and 15 takes a little bit of the running game out and it makes Kirk Cousins a little bit, you know, a lot more on his shoulders. And I think styles make fights. One other nugget I'll bring to your attention, uh, Kirk Cousins really struggles against man coverage and against the blitz. Well, those are two things that the Lions mm. do a lot of. Meanwhile, Jared Goff has actually been the zone king this year, one of the top efficiency numbers against zone coverage this year. Well, that's the style the Vikings like to play, and their secondary, they might get canned answer back this week, but still relatively banged up. And I, I just think this is a really bad matchup for Minnesota and a really good matchup for Detroit. Then the revenge angle, the Lions had a late lead the last time these two teams played in Minneapolis just a few weeks ago, and Minnesota came back, scored a touchdown on the final drive. So there's just so many angles that line up for Detroit in this game. And then you look at the line and the market and the overall fervor that the national media is probably going to, yeah. you know, even, even Dan Campbell said this week, I don't know how we're favored. <laughs> um, well, I can tell you, Dan, because your efficiency rating is significantly better than Minnesota and you're the home team. That yeah. That's why you're favored, right? So I, I think there's just a lot of things that line up for Detroit in this game. Tough for him to play that Lou Holtz 
play of all oh, that team is just so good. They're so much better than us. We're a terrible team. By the way, the over under here is 51 and a half. Twice this year, the Lions games have gone over 70 points. I'm curious real quick. Are you interested at all in the over on 51 and a half? And play the under uh, you again. <laughs> I would not play. The oh, under not. OK, game. gotcha. Um, red zone red zone numbers matter a lot when you're betting over unders the difference between seven and three is massive and every team's going to be in the red zone at some point during the game and your your ability to convert is really to me the difference settling for field goals with a lot of these covers and a lot of these totals throughout the week and the lions right now are playing like the best team in the nfl converting those red zone opportunities to touchdowns maybe it's because of their offensive line maybe it's because of their running game maybe jared goff and ben johnson have just figured things out and i'm on ross st brown's kind of emerged into this dual threat on, on on all ends of the field but the lions right now are a threat in the red zone and that makes them hard to bet an under with yeah we were about to throw jared goff away last year and now all of a sudden you know mm. he's he's kind of had a little bit of a resurgence all right the ravens and the steelers game um this game has shifted a little bit because the Ravens went from five point favorites to three point dogs all after we found out that Lamar Jackson is going to be missing up to a month. So are you taking the bait? The, the, it telling you about the seven and a half eight point move from Lamar to, to Huntley and I, I think that's a little too rich for my blood, especially when you consider the total in this game is in the high 30s. So you're saying that Lamar is basically worth 30 percent of, of, of the points that are going to be scored in this game. And I think it's even more valuable when you consider you're going through Ravens minus three and you're getting all the way up to plus three. I think you add a little bit of extra juice when you're moving points through those key numbers that we talk about so much four, three and then three on the other side. Now, now that this line's kind of settled in the Baltimore plus two range, not as big of a move that's indicating about a full seven. But I, I still think Huntley's only worth six, maybe six and a half, because when I look at his running ability, yeah, that's where Lamar clearly has an edge. But passing ability, I, I think these guys are kind of even. And in the turnover margin, listen, Huntley's not going to be afraid of this moment. He was in this exact moment last year, and he held up pretty well. His first start for Lamar Jackson last year after he got hurt, led a game-winning drive against the Bears, scored a touchdown in the final possession there. And, and then after that, four losses, but all four losses by a combined seven points. They were all one-score games. So he's going to be in this. And that last game of the season against the Steelers – Pittsburgh needed a win to get into the postseason and Baltimore had absolutely nothing to play for and Pittsburgh needed overtime to win that game. So this is a spot where I think Lamar Hunt or, or Tyler Huntley is going to be game in for Lamar Jackson. On the other side, this is Kenny Pickett's first taste of this rivalry. This is a very heated rivalry, Ravens and Steelers, and this Baltimore offense playing very well. Top five unit efficiency since trading for Roquan Smith. So you're getting an uptick in production from the Ravens defense, and we'll see how Kenny Pickett can handle this. My guess is they shut down the run and they make Pickett beat them. That would be my strategy if I was the Ravens defense. So I'm fascinated to see how Pickett looks here. This is going to be probably his biggest test, you know, emotionally, spiritually, defensively for, you know, his young career. And I, I think Huntley's game. So I would absolutely take points with Baltimore in this spot. If I push back on this, I mean, the stats might say that the Steelers have had some big games, though. They have been favorites just three times this year and have covered twice. Meanwhile, the Ravens haven't exactly looked great because they've lost against the spread in seven of the last nine weeks. Those those biases seem like they would play a role in, in your decision making here. Might. I think you I think it's fair to say that the Ravens with Lamar Jackson are an overvalued football team offensively. I, I think those spreads probably like, you know, being favored by nine, ten points mm -hmm. against the uh, the Broncos last week. I know it's Russell Wilson, but it's still a Broncos defense that's that's very good. And then once Lamar got hurt, my guess is Lamar's been nursing this injury for a couple of weeks, and he's probably been slowly trending down until finally the dam burst on Sunday against Denver, and he had to leave the game. But then you move that spread down to where it's in Huntley territory. And again, I think a seven and a half point move for a quarterback. Keep this in mind, last year when it was Aaron Rodgers to Jordan Love, that was a seven, seven and a half point move. And I even thought that was a little too rich. I remember betting the other side in that game on the Packers when they were against the Chiefs and they ended up covering. I think a seven, seven and a half point move should only be reserved for the best starting quarterback against like a really bad backup. 
And I don't think I put Lamar in that category right now. He's not playing that way. And I certainly don't put Tyler Huntley in the worst backup quarterback. I mean, he again, a lot of experience last year mm -hmm. with an offense that he feels comfortable in. So I think that gap is a lot tighter. So when you make the move seven, seven and a half points from Lamar to Huntley, I, I think we're getting value with Baltimore here. Um, it's not the only game where the line has moved because of an injury. The Bucks and the Niners game has moved from a six and a half to three and a half after the Jimmy G injury. Uh, the over under by way in this game is at 37. So are you a believer in Brock Purdy? Yeah, he's pretty purdy, right? I mean, this is this is. I know. I'm sure every every media person in, on the planet is using that. I had to avoid uh, it. So I, I just put the ball on a tee there for you. So I'm sorry. I My took bad. the bait. <laughs> I took the bait, Steve. I'm really good at taking the bait. Um, listen, this is a this is an interesting game because you have the Bucks, you have Tom Brady on a short week. And I think defensively, that matters more than offensively, right? They're coming off a really tough physical game against the Saints where they had the battle back and they needed the full 60 uh, to get that win. And, you know, they had Ingram and, and Kamara slamming it into the line of scrimmage, that really good Saints offensive line kind of battling them. And I think that's where I struggle a little bit um, with trusting this Bucks defense to just completely shut down Brock Purdy. Now, on the other side, you look at Purdy, this is a very paint by numbers offense, right? You, you, you get the ball out quick, you get the ball into the hands of arguably the most talented cast of characters in the entire NFL, McCaffrey, Debo, you got Kittle, a tight end. I mean, it's just take your pick. These guys are yak monsters. So really all Purdy has to do is run the offense, take the snap, execute the handoffs, get the balls out with the, you know, the, the, the screen passes and, and the little hit routes that they like to run on the outside, just execute. Now, the other upside here is I'm really impressed with his mobility. I think, you know, Brock's mobility is a big upgrade from Jimmy G. And again, look at what we saw Huntley to Jackson, seven and a half point move. Well, Jimmy G to Brock Purdy is only a three point move. So the market's kind of telling you that the Niners, is, you know, their offense is still going to be relatively efficient um, with Purdy under center and I, I tend to agree because I think this offense is more about scheme and and you know timing than it is arm talent and and quarterback depth of of, of ability so I I think Purdy will be fine here I'm not saying they're gonna go light the world on fire but I'm certainly not fading him just because of the move from Jimmy G to Brock yeah well you know if this guy puts up a couple of good games he could see a 20 million dollar a year contract on his horizon because that Never seems know. to be how it goes for some of these backup quarterbacks sliding into this role and by the way, the Bucks have had some bad losses this year. I mean, the Browns, the Steelers, the Packers, the Panthers, you know, they've they've had some bad losses. So they're and, and they had to make this massive comeback against the Saints as well. So it's not like this is a Bucks team that looks like that Super Bowl contending champion. Meanwhile, you see the 49ers and, you know, that's a team that does look like they're ready to take that step again. Yeah, I, I think San Francisco is a is, is a play on team. Mm. And if you're going to if you're going to give me value because Purdy's in and maybe they're not as like the quarterback isn't quite as efficient, maybe I, I, I think I'll take it because I still think this defense is really good. On the other side, listen, Brady, I, I don't know what to make of Tampa right now. I, I think they're kind of hanging on by a thread. I, I think this game should energize Tom a little bit. He's from the Bay Area. He grew up rooting for the 49ers you know I don't know if that's worth anything on the point spread but I certainly think Tampa Bay is going to be throwing the football down the field they have the highest passing play rate of any team in the NFL that's why I like the over in this game I just I I, I think Purdy will do enough to keep the Niners offense on schedule mm. and especially if the Niners take the lead and you turn Brady into having to chase the game like he did the other night they're going to be throwing it 40 50 times in this game and if the ball is going to be in the air that much and you're telling me this totals in the high 30s? I, I I have a feeling we we sneak over this one. But there is going to be rain there too, so that could play a major role into whether or not they're going to be thrown. But hey, maybe this is Tom Brady getting a closer look at his future team. Uh, the Eagles and the Giants. Uh, over under on this one is 44. Saquon Barkley's availability is now in doubt because of this surprise Nick injury. Does that affect your approach as you take a closer look at this one? I'm glad I bet my under before that news broke. I, I liked the under before this game. I thought even if Saquon was 100%, 
I mean, go look at what the Eagles did to Derrick Henry and the Titans last week. Jonathan Gannon put eight in the box on about 50% of snaps, and he dared Ryan Tannehill to beat him. And then on the back end, he disguised the coverages so well, shifting back and forth between that too high shell that we see so much in the NFL these days against those explosive offenses, shifting his safeties down into the box like simultaneous. I mean, it was a master class scheme for Jonathan Gannon against this Titans uh, offense last week. And if Ryan Tannehill could not diagnose the coverage, I don't put a lot of faith in Daniel Jones to do it. So if they shut down the run, which again, no Saquon, it makes it even easier to shut down the run. I still think the Giants will still try to set up the run, even if Saquon's out in this game. But if they can't run the football and it's Daniel Jones, who, by the way, you would assume game script is going to favor the Eagles here. So the Eagles get in front. Daniel Jones then has to chase the game and has to try to score with a very pedestrian group of weapons and a really good scheme on the other end. I think the Giants are going to be, you know, behind the eight ball a lot in this game. And another metric that I think plays into account a lot here, this is the biggest discrepancy of early down efficiency you'll see in any game this week. The Eagles offensive early down efficiency compared to the Giants defense and then flop it. And we've discussed the early downs, first and second, much more predictive of how good you are of a football team compared to third and fourth downs, which can be very volatile and very pass heavy. So I, I, I think that to me is where I'm at here. I, I think this game stays under, especially over that total of 44 and a half, which is remember 44 is that dividing line. If it's over that number, I like the under, even if it sinks below with the Saquon news, I still think 44, 43 and a half, still a fair bet to the under here in this game. It does feel like the Eagles are going to want to try to shorten this game as much as possible. I mean, they've got a two game lead of 11 and one over the Dallas Cowboys. Um, and this week they rested 10 of their starters, tried to light in their workload as coaches try to manage the health of these teams on an 18 week schedule you know these lighter workload practice schedules might be more of a play but what I'm worried about is do, do you think that that signals a reduced intensity from Philadelphia against a, a Giants team that you know has only won one of their last five games and really needs a win right here. I don't think the Eagles can afford to take their foot off the gas. The Cowboys are coming. And <laughs> that game in a couple of weeks is going to be real fun. Christmas Eve, Cowboys, Eagles. Probably will decide the division, frankly. So I, I, I don't think the Giants, as good and as feisty as they've been this year, we called the top a few weeks ago. We were one week early against Jacksonville. And then from that game, I mean, you've just seen – the 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 efficiency against Seattle they barely beat the Texans you know Lions Cowboys Commanders all losses are tied so you know you I, I think the top was in this Giants team accomplished so much this year exceeded their win total and Brian Dable's done a heck of a job Wink Martindale and, and Mike Cat I mean they they deserve a, a you know the Nobel Peace Prize for what they've been able to do with this Giants team with the talent on this roster winning seven games but I just think the story is not going to end well um, for our friends over at Big Blue World. If not the, Mo the Nobel, at least maybe the Fields Medal because the math does sure. not add up. Uh, that's no. how Jared values his best bets of the week. Make sure you check out our other segment where he focuses on the Jets and the Giants point spread. For Jared Smith, PicksWise, I'm Steve Obermeyer. This is Finalysis.